Hello and welcome to another episode of General Nerdery. Last week I made a post saying that I was going to take some time to study Bitcoin and that I'd be back to explain what I had learned, and I intend to do exactly that. However, a lot's happened with Bitcoin over the past week and it bears some discussion. First of all, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is virtual currency, that is to say, digital money. Money that exists on the internet only as part of a peer-to-peer -peer network that works not too dissimilarly from the way BitTorrent works, that is to say, a network of computers rather than one central server. Bitcoins can be used to purchase goods and services online, they can be donated to various charitable organizations, they can be even exchanged through brokerage houses for other forms of currency. That's where the similarities end, however. Bitcoins are not backed by any real-world item like gold or oil. Instead, they are generated out of thin air by computers doing complex math equations, believe it or not. Unlike paper money, though, that a government can continue to print and therefore decreasing the value of all of it, there will never be more than approximately 21 million Bitcoins in existence. This means that once that 21 million Bitcoin limit is reached, theoretically, the value of an individual Bitcoin can only continue to rise as they become more scarce. They are not connected to the government or economy of any country. Bitcoins are also anonymous meaning that although this is a peer-to-peer -peer network and all transactions are known throughout the network, although not visible to individual users, the transactions are seen as payments of Bitcoins from one key, that is a, a code number, to another key. Neither key is linked to a name and therefore cannot be traced to you or anyone else. It's really a fascinating idea. It was developed by a Japanese computer scientist about two years ago and uh, has been gaining steam ever since. I first learned about Bitcoins about four months ago. At the time, the exchange rate for US dollars to Bitcoins was about 90 cents to one Bitcoin. The current exchange rate, as I'm recording now, is about $14 to one Bitcoin. Sounds like a massive improvement, except when you take into account that just a few days ago, they were worth over $30. And now we get into all the happenings with Bitcoins over the past week. Two United States Senators, Charles Schumer of New York and Joe Manchin of West Virginia, have gotten their knickers in a twist over Bitcoin. The controversy seems to center around an underground website called the Silk Road. Not that Silk Road. The Silk Road in question is an underground website where an individual can purchase virtually any illegal drug that you can imagine, and they happen to accept Bitcoins as payment. So of course, it's the money's fault. Once again, we're faced with a situation where politicians and lawmakers simply don't understand a technology, so they go, go ahead and stamp it with the bad label and try to ban it. But you know what? I can understand. After all, it's not like there's ever been any other way for criminals to exchange money without there being a way for the government to track it. It's just never been done before. Let me spell this out. Technology is neither good nor evil. It's a tool. And like any tool, it can be used to help or to harm. The same hammer that can be used to build a home for a needy family can also be used to bash somebody's brains in. But we don't have people going around and trying to ban hammers. Why don't we? Because everybody understands how a hammer works. But a concept like Bitcoin is a bit too complicated for an aging senator to grasp immediately, so their impulse is, it must be bad. Ban it! Not to say that they even could, really, because if it's peer-to-peer -peer nature and not existing on a central server, the only thing they could possibly do would be to shut down the currency exchanges here in the country, and only the ones here in the country. That wouldn't really stop anybody from going out of the country to use them. They could shut down the website where the Bitcoin software comes from, but it's open source, which means that anybody out there can continue the project from where it was left off. So at this point, the cat's out of the bag. Bitcoin is out there and it can't be shut down. All the bad press that it's been getting lately, I, by, all the, by all the bad press, I mean one news story, has however caused the value, the trading value to plummet. That's because uh, a lot of the value that had been attributed to Bitcoin was simply because of speculators. People investing money, buying Bitcoins and holding on to them, thinking that it may be very valuable someday. And they might be very valuable someday if this story doesn't completely destroy their credibility. And I hope it doesn't, it's a phenomenal idea. 
It could stand to one day be a standard for international trade and a phenomenal tool to, for anyone who appreciates their privacy in an age when it's getting harder to harder to keep anything private. So that's my little rant. Now what I'm going to do is show you where to get the Bitcoin software, explain the basics of how to use it, and show you where you can get Bitcoins from. Okay, so the first thing you need to do to start using Bitcoin is download and install a Bitcoin client. You can get this at its home site, bitcoin.org. Here you can download it for Windows, Linux, or Mac. You can also download the source code as this is an open source project. The site also has many other resources to help you learn about Bitcoin and where you can use it. After you've downloaded and installed the software, go ahead and open it up. And it should look something like this. From top to bottom, we have our file button. This simply allows you to exit, exit the program. We have settings, which allows you to access your receiving address, which at the moment is also being displayed here. But you can have more than one receiving address, but you can have more than one receiving addresses, and it would keep track of them and display them all right here. Options, which allows you to set the program options, like for example, do you want the program to start up when the system starts up? You want to minimize to the tray, which means in here, instead of minimizing to the taskbar. And allow the program to automatically map a path through your router, which can help it communicate with the network. And the program also allows you to set up a proxy for an even greater degree of anonymity. Help simply tells you information about the program, which version you are running, who it's licensed to, and so forth. If you want to send someone coins, you would click the Send Coins button. Now they will have sent you their Bitcoin address. It would look something like this, or like this. Simply paste it into this space here, and the amount that you want to send. Then click Send, and that's all there is to it. If you've, if you've communicated with this person in the past, have sent them money in the past, or received money from them in the past, you will have them in your address book, and you can add them from that as well. Speaking of the address book, here it is. You can manually add addresses. I believe that if you send money to someone, it will automatically add them to your sending list, but I'm not sure about that. I mentioned address before. This is my current Bitcoin address. This is a public cryptographic key, uh, which means that it's safe to show to anyone because literally the only thing that could possibly be done with this number is to send me Bitcoins. I'm not asking for any, I'm just using this as an example. Even if I had any Bitcoins, the fact that this number is out and available would not gain anybody the ability to view how many Bitcoins I have or take them from me or anything like that. As you can fi probably figure, the balance is displayed here. If I had any Bitcoins, this is where they would be shown. And the program also keeps records of any transactions that I have made, which at the moment is none. Down here you can see that there are four connections, meaning that I am currently connected to four different nodes or four different other users out on the internet that are using Bitcoin. And they are connected to several users in turn and so forth until everybody is connected to everyone else. Blocks you no longer have to worry about. They actually took that feature out of the Bitcoin software with the latest iteration. Uh, basically, the Bitcoin client itself used to be able to work using your CPU to solve the math problems necessary to generate new Bitcoins. However, because the difficulty of these problems scales up depending on how many and how powerful computers are trying to solve them, it has now reached the point where it is no longer feasible for an individual with a home computer to do this. It would simply take far, far, far too long for a home computer to get the 50 Bitcoin reward, which is awarded to uh, the computer which solves one of these problems. This final entry, zero transactions. If I had received or sent Bitcoins, then it would uh, indicate that here. And that is actually the Bitcoin software. It's really just that simple. Now there's one other feature. Uh, it's not actually a feature in the software, but uh, how to use it properly. And I expect they will make this easier in a future, future iteration, but if you want to back up your wallet, basically back up your Bitcoins, you can do that. And it's recommended, in fact, that you do. But you can't do it through the program. You have to do it manually. I'll show you how to do that, at least in Windows. Open Windows Explorer. You will have to have the option for view hidden folders and files turned on to do this. Click your C drive and then click users. Select your home folder. 
Then select App Data. Then select Roaming. Finally select Bitcoin. And then this file right here, your wallet, is the file that you would need to keep and back up to make sure that you can retrieve your Bitcoins if something happened to your computer, for example. This is also a file you want to keep secure because if someone else got their hands on it, they could get your Bitcoins. So it's not difficult if you know where it is. But still, I expect that in a future version of the software, they will have a backup button or something, at least to open up the folder where your Bitcoin wallet is stored directly rather than having to navigate to it. Now, I said I would show you how to get Bitcoins, uh, other than, of course, being paid them by someone else. And since they have taken the Generate Bitcoins option out of the program, and I think rightfully so, we are left with an option to earn them, or make them, and that is by joining a uh, pool of computers that are all working to solve blocks together. The easiest one that I have found is called Bitcoin Plus. The way it works, you create an account, then you go to Generate Bitcoins. If you click the Start Generating button, then the Bitcoin Plus website will start using up all the spare CPU cycles that your computer has. Meaning that, for example, if you have a monitor as I have here, it will get maxed out at 100%. But it doesn't slow your computer down because it's set as a very low priority, which means if any other program needs to use those CPU cycles, needs to make use of your computer's processor, then it gets out of the way for them. Because there are so many people working at the same time to generate bitcoins, it results in very regular payouts. For me, it's usually about one payout per hour. And the speed will depend on the speed of your computer, and probably your internet connection as well. However, the payouts are in a very, very small amount. As you can see, the current rate is 0.00008549 bitcoins, which is not very much at all but it does add up over time. And if Bitcoins are someday worth hundreds or even thousands of dollars each, and they might be, then it will, be, will have been worth your time. At this time, I can't say it's really worth the amount of electricity that it takes running your computer processor at 100% for days, weeks, or years. So mostly it's just something to do for fun. So that's the basics of how to use the Bitcoin software. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and the little rant that went along with it. If you're interested in learning more about Bitcoin, I'm also going to include in the show notes a link to the episode of the Security Now podcast where I initially learned about Bitcoin. In that podcast, Steve Gibson explains Bitcoin in far more detail than I would have time to do here. So that's all, and I'll see you next time on General Nerdery.